Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. I'm allowed to start now. It's after our initial wrong start, but that's okay. So anyways, so my name is Scott Ambler. I'm here to uh, uh, work through how teams, how you as, uh, as Agilists can choose your wow. How, how, how do you choose your way of working and do so in, effective, in, a, in an effective manner? So I've been, uh, one of the things I get to do, I get to go to organizations around the world uh, to do this, help them understand this Agile and Lean stuff and improve the way that they work and improve uh, their organization and, and in, improve their, their working environments. And I've, I, I luckily got involved with Agile right from the very beginning. And I, I, the, I was the thought leader, the, the, you know, the, the person who led the development of the Agile modeling method, um, which at the time was answering some very serious questions. How do we go about modeling and documentation in an Agile manner? And, Many of these concepts have been adopted and reinvented in some cases um, over the years now, uh, as well as the Agile data method, which is finally taking off. Um, I'm seeing more and more Agile data warehousing teams and the data management folks are finally sort of getting into this stuff. And probably you know, more pertinent is, along with Mark Lyons who's in the back there, the co-creator of the Discipline Agile Toolkit, and, uh, which is what we're, what we're gonna be talking about the application of today. So um, what I wanna talk about I want to talk about three steps or three, three steps to choosing your wow, choosing your way of working. Um, first, to understand the situation that you're in and accept that. Uh, this is a major step in many cases. There's a lot of uh, people in denial about the actual complexity of the situation that they face. The uh, next step is how do, we, how do we adopt what we call a guided continuous improvement strategy or a guided Kaizen loop, um, depending on the way you like to call that. And then finally, how do we go about choosing and evolving our wow? So let's, you know, let's get into it. So how do, we, how do we remove our heads from the sand? How do we actually uh, accept our situation? So one of the things we, we've noticed, which I think is pretty harmful, is organization, many organizations will call themselves, I'm a scrum shop, I'm a, I'm a safe shop, you know, we're a safe shop, we're a Kanban shop, we're a less shop, or whatever. Um, I hope that nobody, and, and, and unfortunately people do, but we really hope that nobody's calling themselves a discipline agile shop um, because it's really, um, it, it limits you. And, you know, the, when you call yourself you know, an XYZ shop, whatever it happens to be, it limits you to that sort of environment and you really want to pick and choose the, the strategies that make sense for you. So, um, although if you had to call yourself one type of shop, I guess discipline agile shop is your best bet. Um, anyways, um, one, of the, one of the principles in discipline agile is that context counts. And this is one of, my, my, one of my favorite diagrams to show to executives in organizations because what happens is when I walk them through this diagram, and the basic message is that you face multiple, when you, when you talk about scaling Agile and scaling your approach or scaling your way of working, there's multiple factors, there's multiple issues that you're probably dealing with. Not just, because when people think about scaling, they often think about how do we do this on large teams? And certainly some of the, the scaling frameworks like Less and Safe and, and arguably Nexus deal with the large team situation. And that's important, but there's more to scaling than that. Like, you know, how do you address regulatory situations? How do you address geographic um, dis distributed teams? What do you do when you've got a very complex situation? What do you do when you have great con technical complexity? And so when I, when I walk, people through this slide, and particularly executives, the only response I've ever gotten from this slide from, from executives and organizations is, oh my lord, we've got all of these problems. We're all over the board. And uh, you know, I'll, in workshops, I'll often ask teams to you know, rate yourself. Uh, where, you know, where is your team right now in all these scaling factors? And you know, I've done workshops where I've you know, given out this on a piece of paper and asked people to you know, draw the radar chart and then we put them on the wall, and it's amazing. Like even in people in the same organization, and the teams will be all over the board. There'll be some where you know, the, the situation is very simple. There'll be some where you know, they're all over the place. And we have to come to the conclusion that, yes, some, the occasional team is in these very straightforward situations where we're a small, reasonably co-located team taking on a reasonably straightforward problem. And a lot of, you know, some of the simpler methods are geared for those situations. But we also have to accept the fact and observe that we have teams that aren't. We have teams that are, that are globally distributed and teams that are large and teams that are medium sized and so on. So a large team will work differently than a small team. A team in a regulatory environment will work differently than a team in a non-regulatory environment. 
a team taking on a, a hard problem will work in a different way than a team taking on a simple problem. Right? This is basic, fundamental concepts. So one process size does not fit all. One way of working will not work for you. Like unless all your teams are the same types of people in the same situation, taking the same sorts of problems, one process, one method, one framework will not work for you. Right? So we need to be, you know, we need to understand that context counts. So there's no easy button. You know, if you're from North America, you, you probably recognize this ad, the, you know, one of the, the, I think it's Staples or Business Depot, you know, you, you got a hard problem, you hit the easy button and, and they can solve it is their message. And there, there is no easy button for this agile stuff. There is no, no easy button for this organization structure stuff, which is why we get paid what we get paid. I mean, if it was an easy problem, they'd be hiring people with no skill to do this job. Um, another thing that I ask people to observe is your organization, and this, this came out in the keynote today, um, it sort of came out in the keynote today, is your organization is what's called a complex adaptive system. And we like to look at organizations as team, you know, teams that are working together. And this is, was very clearly coming out in, in Holacracy, where we have these teams, and every team should, should be allowed to and should be enabled to figure out their own way of working, to figure out here's what we do. And that's, and so when you look at these team bubbles, that's the inner bubble, our internal way of working. But there's also a boundary. There's also, there's also this interface to the team, the external way of working. How do I interact with this other team? And I will work with your team in a different manner than your team because you're different, different people on different teams and you've got different ways of working. And when, I, when my team collaborates with your team, we will probably learn something from you. You will probably learn something from us. We will, I hope, internalize that and change the way that we work because we picked up some tips and techniques from you and, and, and vice versa. So not only are we, do we have these collections of teams interacting with each other, but all the teams are constantly evolving and constantly changing their way of working. And this is um, exactly what we're, what we're hearing about this morning in the keynote. So we need to embrace, we need to embrace this concept as well. Um, and this is a very interesting thing in a lot of organizations because management will often cringe at this concept of, well, what do you mean that different, all these teams will work in different ways? And, my, and, and, and I would invite you to actually observe what really happens, like, even in organizations where you have a repeatable process and you know, CMMI and whatever it is that you're doing, the teams are still working in completely different ways. And they might be faking the process, they'll be faking the process in similar ways and making it look as if they're working in the same way, but they're really working in their own ways because they're unique people taking on a unique problem. So let's embrace this and let's enable this. Let's help teams be the best they can in the situation they face. Let's help them improve and get better and let's make this easy and, and, and make this desirable to do. Um, like why wouldn't we want people to learn and improve and get better and become more effective at whatever it is that they're trying to do? Um, so in the toolkit, we look at the overall picture. So one of the, one of the things we see in um, many Agile transformations, and Mark and I are gonna talk about this tomorrow, um, in another talk, is that a common mistake that organizations make is that they only focus on software development. They'll only focus on adopting Scrum or adopting Kanban and, and then applying it um, in their software development teams, which is great, but we need to observe the fact that there's other parts of the organization. And if these other parts of the organization are working in very different ways, so if, you know, if my team is trying to be agile, but their procurement folks are very non-agile, or the finance folks are very non-agile, it pretty much shoots us in the foot, right? So we all need to be working and learning and getting better and working this flexible learning approach. So the, the overall, so um, today my focus is on the bottom layer, discipline agile delivery, but the principles and the strategies all apply at these other layer, or organizational layers or organizational process areas, um, call them whatever you want. So one of, the, one of the things we, we like to, uh, one, of the, one of the ideas that we like to promote is this concept called guided continuous improvement. So how can we up our game? How can we help teams learn and improve and get better? So a lot of things that, we're, that we, we hear about a lot, like teams should own their own process. Well, how do we enable a team to own its own process? I think is a, a very, other than just saying, you know, you know you're, you're empowered, um, Phil was talking about this earlier. You know, you walk in, you talk, tell a team, congratulations, you're empowered. Well, that, that's meaningless, right? Um, you've got to help them become empowered, give them the tools to help them do that. So 
Um, Ivar Jakobsen, uh, and many of you might know him, as, he's one of the, the you know, three amigos that you know, gave us the UML, and um, he promoted use cases and unified process and uh, many, many good things, and sometimes not so, some good things. But um, he's recently been writing about um, this concept called method prison. And what he's observing, and what's certainly what we've been observing, and it's, it's wonderful that he's given a term to it, is that um, teams and organizations are finding themselves in framework, this framework or method prison where they're constrained by the methodology, by the, the mindset that they've adopted from whoever it is that's promoting that framework or that method. Um, so maybe it's time to break out. So, although having said that, to be fair, adopting a prescriptive method makes sense. I'm sure you, many of you have seen this curve where the, what, you, what happens is when you adopt this new idea, you, you take a productivity hit at the very beginning. So you'll adopt Scrum, you'll adopt Safe, you adopt Kanban, you adopt whatever, and there's a little bit of a learning curve, and you know, you're not quite as effective at the very beginning, so you, you take, there's a dip in productivity, and if things work out well, then everything gets better and you improve, but then you, you, hit, the, you hit the limit. So, you know, Scrum takes, you know, tells you about whatever, it, you know, tells you about its, its, uh, its thing, and Kanban has got its, its advice. So it solves the problem that it solves, and then you sort of peek out. Um, and this is, a, this is a very common pattern. So, but to be fair, things have gotten better. So this is, this is probably good. Um, so one of the things we've noticed is that there's a lot of interesting promises. Um, now, this is a great book. I don't know if, you, if this is Jeff Southern's latest book. And I don't know if, you've, if you haven't read it, you, should, you might want to take a look at it. It's, it's pretty good. Um, but look at the cover. He's promising, he's, he's effectively promising four times productivity. Do twice the amount of work in half the time. That's, you know, two divided by one, one half. It's four, four times productivity. That's a wonderful promise, and everybody buy, you know, a lot of people buy into it, and that's great. Um, and, and I've certainly seen improvements like that. If, you know, if there's a phenomenally dysfunctional team, then yes, almost any type of change will help them improve. I've literally, a couple years ago, I worked with a team. We improved, you know, we changed the coffee that they had, and I would, I would swear there was like almost a 20% productivity increase almost instantly by getting rid of the crappy coffee and, you know, producing you know, and replacing it with something drinkable. Um, so certainly, you know, if you've got a phenomenally dysfunctional team, you can get pretty good productivity improvements. Um, but I'm also a firm believer in numbers. And there's a fellow by the name of Don Reifer. I don't know if you, if you know him or not. If, if you don't, you should get, you should, uh, get, uh, get familiar with some of his work. He did his PhD in Agile transformations, and he basically asked the question, um, how effective is this Agile stuff? You know, what, what types of productivity improvements are we actually getting? And what's, what I find interesting about Don is that he, you know, once he finished his PhD, um, he turned it into a business, and he now um, he coaches and he, and he works with organizations around the world, and he's also continuing his studies. So he's got data from, what is it, 3,500 teams. I think it's 3,500 now. This, this data is a little bit old. Um, but certainly over 3,000 teams. So this is statistically significant. And what he's seeing is that he's seeing a 7 to 12% productivity increase. So he's seeing a line that looks like this, the, the type of line that we've been talking about for years. And he's actually got data. Now, 7 to 12% improvement, that, that's good. Like, that's a good thing. I'm, I'm not going to, you can't sneeze at that. But it's not the 300% productivity improvement that we've heard about. Right, so, um, and at scale, his numbers are showing three to five percent improvement. Still okay, but certainly maybe not quite as good as we would hope. So I think there's some, you know, a little bit of um, imp you know, room for improvement here on the improvement side is good. And what's also interesting is that when you read some of the DevOps case studies, you know, you read about Amazon and eBay and Google and all these companies, they are seeing significant productivity increases. And, you know, you read some of these DevOps case studies, and it's like rocket science. Like, it's unbelievable. Some of the things, you know, you, you, know you, you talk about, you know, releasing into production, you know, many, many times an hour, and, or, you know, Amazon releases into production every few seconds now. And you, you, talk, you, you talk about these sorts of ideas to, you know, banks and insurance companies, and they can't even conceive it. They can't even conceive that, and yet it's nothing for the Amazons of the world. So the, how do they do that? And the DevOps case studies are all the same. They're all, you know, at some point in the distant past, we realized that we were going to get wiped out, 
if by another competitor if we didn't get our act together. So they decided to improve. And they, uh, uh, sometimes the, the study, you know, the case study is all about, they thought it was a, a transformation project. Sometimes they were a little more advanced than that. But they very quickly um, realized that it's a transformation journey and that they, the way that you improve is you make small improvements over time, exactly what the, the, you know, the lean folks have been talking about for decades. You do this you know, Kaizen uh, type improvement, you know, small improvements over time add up. So they talk about constantly improving. And exactly what, what uh, Richard was talking about this morning, where you, you, know, you feel a tension, so you come up with an idea, and you try it out, and you experiment, and you see if it works. So this, you know, P and there, you know, there's different, you know, there's OODA loops and PDSA, PD, PDS, PDCA, and all this sort of stuff. Um, but there's different, they all boil down to the same sort of thing. So you, you identify a potential improvement, and then you experiment with it. You, you try it out in your situation. So just because something worked for some, you know, you know TDD, works for somebody else, doesn't mean it's going to work for you. You don't know. you got to try it out. Because there's no such thing as the best practice. All practices are contextual in nature. So just because something works well for, for this team down the hall, doesn't mean it's going to work for you at all. you got to give it a try, see what happens. So you give it a try. You know, you've got to give it you know, long enough to, you know, to actually assess fairly. So then you make an assessment. How well did this work for, you, for us? Did TDD work? And, or what aspects of TDD works for us? What aspects don't? And if you're smart, you, you adopt the stuff that works well, and you avoid the stuff that doesn't work so well. Um, and if you're really smart, you realize, hey, we've got another tension, so let's figure out you know, what new problem we need to solve. And if you're nice, you share your learnings with others. You say, hey, TDD worked for us, and this is really cool, and you offer to, offer to coach or help other teams learn this, you know, this thing that you just did. So this is all wonderful. This is you know, lean 101 type stuff, improvement 101 type stuff. Now, the issue, though, is the very first step. And, and Richard was talking about this, this morning. Um, you know, you feel attention, so you come up with an idea and you, you try it out. Well, how do you know what to try? Because there's hundreds, if not thousands, of practices out there. So this is where the, the toolkit comes into play. So the issue is we're not process experts. The vast, you know, very few, few of us are process experts. So how do you own your own process when you don't even know it's for sale? Like if you don't know, if, you've only, if, you've only, if you're in method prison and you've only been told about the 12 practices of this method or the 15 practices of this framework, um, and you're now a certified master in it, how do, you, how do you learn about these other potential techniques that might work better for you? So this is what we talk about in the toolkit. So where we see improvement, um, where we see continuous improvement, like the, you know, the, the DevOps case studies and good stuff like that, um, where we see this, you know, this, these improvement lines, the dashed one, and it's not never this smooth, right? It's up and down. It's sort of this bouncy thing. But it, it, it trends over time. It trends upwards. Um, you can improve this through making better decisions to begin with. So instead of just coming up, hey, why don't we try this technique and see what happens? Well, wait a minute. You know, we've got this problem. We detect this tension. Here's five or six good strategies that might work for us. Here's the trade-offs involved with them. So let's talk about, hey, you know, We've got five different options. This option sounds like it's gonna, more, most likely going to work for us. So let's try it. So we can have fewer failures. Because we're always talking about failing fast in Agile, which is a good thing. I would rather succeed early. I would rather you know, succeed faster. So if I can have fewer failed experiments, fewer learning op you know, for, you know, We always spin out oh, a learning opportunity if the experiment failed. Well, you know what? I would rather have had the experiment succeed to begin with. And so we can, we can improve the, the angle of our improvement by making better decisions to begin with. So that's basically what we're talking about with the toolkit. And you can get your way out of method prison by doing this. So if you've adopted Scrum, you've adopted Safe or Less or you know, whatever it is you've adopted, it's great. You've achieved some benefit, whatever that level of benefit is. But if you've hit the, if you've hit the barriers, if you're sort of struggling to how do we get better now, well, let's get on this curve. Let's start doing this more of this guided continuous improvement thing. So it can be Scrum plus DA or Safe plus DA to help you solve the problems that you actually face. So we can get out of jail with just a little bit of guidance. So how do we keep this lightweight? How do we make this simple and easy for you? So how do we choose our way of working is, I think, the fundamental question here. Uh, another way to look at it is how do we be a better Agile chef? So 
when, from an agile point of view, we have all these ingredients, you test driven development, and um, planning poker, and user stories, and mob programming, and pair programming, and you know, continuous integration, there's hundreds, maybe thousands of practice. At this conference this week, there will, there will be hundreds of good ideas presented by the various speakers. I guarantee that. I guarantee that. And they'll contradict each other, of course, but it's all, all good stuff. But how the heck do you choose between all those, all those things? How do you even know about them? Because you can't possibly sit in, even though we're at this conference, there's four or five other talks going on right now. So you can't hear everything. You can't hear all this good advice from everybody. So we've got to, luckily they're being filmed, so you can look at them later, I guess. But still, um, we've got an issue. So how do we, how do we detect? So the point is, there's, there's lots of great practices and ideas out there. Um, and then of course, we've got recipes. So just going to, the, you know, going to the market and buying a bunch of ingredients doesn't make dinner, right? We have to, either you've got to be a chef, you've got to be a cook, and you've got to know how to put these ingredients together to make a great, a great meal, or you've got, to have a you know, you've got to have a recipe book to follow, which is what these methods and frameworks are all about. The challenge, though, is that you don't want to eat the same meal every single day. So for example, you know, uh, my daughter, I've got an eight-year-old daughter, she could live on mac and cheese. You know, you know this would be a, 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 an ideal environment if we could feed her, if we were willing to feed her mac and cheese for every single meal, she'd be a happy kid, probably at least for a few weeks until she got sick of it. But anyways, you're not always in a mac and cheese situation, right? You know, sometimes you want to have different, different meals. Like I'm sure, does anybody have the same dinner every single night? No, of course, well, every so often there's some weird person that does that. But um, you, you typically don't want to. You, you want to have a variety. Variety is the spice of life. So the challenge with, the, with these recipes, with these methods, with these frameworks, um, they're great, but they give you one answer. They give you, you know, mac and cheese. So, um, for example, this is the, the Scrum Bach. I don't know if you're familiar with the Scrum Guide. I don't know if you're familiar with this. this and this is great. This is like eight, 16 or 18 pages, depending on how you count, uh, of awesomeness. There's some great ideas here, but it's a little bit thin. Right? There's a bunch of great stuff, which is wonderful, but it, and it gives you one recipe. It gives you the scrum recipe. And, and, it, they, and they, wave their arm, they wave their hands. They say, yes, you can have you know, different, you, you can change it up and, and, uh, and, and, and do whatever you want. But you still end up with mac and cheese. Right? So here in this mac and cheese, there's some spice on there. Ooh, you know, big, huge improvement. Um, and yeah, so you can have spicy mac and cheese or change up the cheese. Well, you know, you can tailor the, the, the recipe a bit, but for the most part, you end up with mac and cheese. So, how do you, how do you expand your horizons? You know, say we're not university students anymore, and we're not living on mac and cheese. Um, so, how do we do that? So, Discipline Agile is based on seven principles. And they're all, I, I hope they're, you know, fairly, fairly uh, common. Uh, one of them is a lean concept. We want to delight our customers, not just satisfy, we want to delight them. Uh, we want to make them happy, because if, if we don't delight our customers, somebody else will, and we'll steal that customer away from us. We want to, be, we want to have awesome teams, we want to have awesome people working on awesome teams, doing awesome things. This is um, you know, straight out of modern, the modern Agile stuff. We want to be pragmatic. We need to get away from the purism. It's not about being Agile, it's about being better. It's about you know, delighting our customers and being awesome and, and good stuff like that. So let's, let's do the best we can in the situation that we face. And sometimes that means we work in a traditional manner. And that's okay. Context counts. Different teams in different situations will work in different ways. And choice is good. So I can't make different types of things for dinner for my daughter if I don't have access to a market. If my market only sells macaroni and only sells cheese and only sells that spice that was on top of the mac and cheese, then I'm still only going to be able to make mac and cheese. I need to have a range of ingredients that it can then combine in an intelligent manner into something that's editable. We want to optimize our flow. We want to make sure it all works together. Like I was saying earlier, it's no good if we have an agile, like an agile software development team, but, we still, but our finance team is still forcing us to do big estimates up front. Or the procurement team takes six months to, get a, to order a chair for us, you know, for our team room, that type of stuff. Um, let alone other, other nastiness. And we want to be enterprise aware. We want to do what's right for the company, not just what's convenient for us. We want to look at the bigger picture. So how does, how does this all, all play out? So I've been, been talking about a toolkit. So what does this toolkit look like? So how do we provide choice? So, in, so first of all, the, 
you want to initially so figure out what situation you're in and initially tailor your approach to meet the reality of your team and the, and the situation that you face. So a large team will organize, organize itself differently than a small team. Um, and then, of course, over time, we want to reflect. We want to improve. You know, we, we identify attention. Let's try to improve on it. Let's solve the problem. So one of the things that we do in Discipline Agile is we support multiple life cycles. So it's observable in most organizations that you have some teams doing Scrum, some teams doing Kanban, some teams doing other things. So a large team will be following a program type of a life cycle. You'll have some teams doing projects. How many people here work in, a, in organizations where you still have projects? How many, team, how many also work in an organization where you also have long-standing teams? They're no longer a project team. And how, many, how many have both? Yeah, both. And it, fair enough, right? And those teams work in a different way. You'll have some teams doing more of a continuous delivery um, type of a thing versus the project, you know, the Scrum project teams. And that's okay. Different teams, different situations will do different things. And of course, they might improve over time. We very often see a team start with one method or one framework or one approach, and then as they learn, as they evolve over time, the life cycle changes as well because they, they adopt different practices. So you start adopting practices like continuous integration, continuous deployment, you start moving away from a Scrum type approach into more of a CD type of approach, and that's fine. This is normal. Nothing wrong with that. Um, now, what we also do is because in many organizations, management freaks out at this concept of, well, what do you mean all these teams are going to be working in different ways? Well, um, we support a consistent level of governance across teams, risk-based as opposed to documentation-based. So let's allow the teams to work in their own way, to have their own way of working, and yet still have consistent lightweight governance that's about motivation and enablement as opposed to command and control. So we can allow the teams to learn and to improve and to change, have this, you know, respect this reality of being a complex adaptive system, and still um, allow them to do their own thing. So we can still have consistent governance, so we can still lead, we can still guide, yet allow the teams to work in their own way. So we've addressed that issue as well, because that's important, because if you don't have a coherent governance strategy, your organization is not going to go for this, you know, allow the teams to do their own thing message, and nor should they. So how do we do this? So when we put the toolkit together, we started noting, so this is all based from practice and from observation, um, because we, we've got the, the privilege of working in, in dozens of organizations around the world and adopting and working with others um, as well. So this is, th these observations are, are effectively based on, on hundreds of people's of experience. And even though we, it's easy to observe that these teams work in different ways, at a high level, they're all achieving the same basic process goals, the same basic outcomes. So they got to, at some point, you had to do something like, to put the team together, for example. You have to do some initial scoping uh, and continuous scoping. You've got to, you know, think about architecture issues. You, I hope you want to grow your team members to help them you know, learn and get better and improve. Um, I hope you're governing your teams. I hope that you're doing risk management, you know, addressing risk throughout, um, throughout the life cycle or throughout the effort. I, I'm sure you deploy into production every so often. Um, so all of our teams are doing these things and more at a high level, but they're all doing it in different ways. So my team deploys into production differently than your team. My team you know, explore scope differently than your team because we're different people in different situations. So a team building a data warehouse will explore scope in a much different way than a team building a mobile app, right? Pretty basic concept. Um, so one, you know, scoping size does not fit all. So to dive down into the details, so, you know, so this is wonderful advice at a high level, but not a lot of good low-level advice. So how do we actually choose our wow, right? So what we do, we have, we have this to simplify things, to make it straightforward, we have these things called goal diagrams. And it takes about five, ten minutes to learn the notation. It's not so, this is the, as complicated as it gets. Um, and it's a little bit fuzzy, sorry about that. Um, but the idea is that, you know, when we're forming a team, there's a bunch of process decisions that we need to make. How big is the team going to be? Where are these people coming from? How available are they? Are they 100% of the team? Are they part-time of the team? How distributed is the team going to be? And so on. So there's a bunch of important decisions that we need to make, and we'll, we will make these at least implicitly, if not explicitly. For each of these issues, there's options. There's different ways that we can geographically distribute the team. It's not just about co-location. It's not just about global. 
Um, so, and then behind all this, we work through what are the, you know, so not only do we describe the options, we say here's the trade-offs that you're making. So now you, you can make intelligent process decisions, you can identify ways to address the tensions that you face, and choose better, make better choices. This is an, another example of a goal diagram. So in behind all those bubbles were diagrams like this. So how do you use this? So when we go to explore scope, it's not just enough to have a list of options. We also need to understand what these options are. So say, for example, we decide that we want to do personas. And we don't know anything about personas. So we can look it up. Here's what a persona is all about. And here's the trade-offs that you're making. So now you've got a better idea of will personas work for, work for us. And then if this is not enough detail, and it might not be, then you can follow the link and read more about personas. And there, because there's wonderful articles and books out there about personas if you want to learn more. So you can start making better decisions. So we can use the toolkit to look up these practices to help us understand what our options are, where, what trade-offs are we making, so that way we can make better choices. We can, do, and, and we can do this in retrospectives, we can do this in initial tailoring sessions when we're identifying our process to begin with, um, and certainly then we want to you know, run experiments and, and find out does this actually work for us. So we can move away from just having mac and cheese to at least now if we're going to eat pasta, because my daughter loves pasta, nothing I can do about that, at least we can change the pasta up and have something a little, little better for date night. Um, my wife certainly won't tolerate having mac and cheese for date night. Um, it's got to be some sort of fancy thing at least. So um, we can have different meals um, at different, at, you know, on different days, and that's okay. You, you know, have, the, have the right meal, have the right process for the situation that you face. So just to wrap up here before I go to q and I want to leave it, it's not about just about dysmenagel, it's not about dad, so it's not about you know, dad or safe or dad or scrum, it's really about dad and scrum or, or scrum and dad or safe and dad. So this is the way we can evolve our way out of method prison, how we can improve our, improve our ways of working. So instead of um, you know, having all this rhetoric around, yeah, if you're doing this method, yes, of course you can improve and tailor to meet your own needs, but then getting no advice, this is, the, this is uh, a good source of advice. So anyways, there's a lot of great stuff in, in, uh, in the toolkit if you're interested. So um, just to wrap up here, any questions or any answers? Answers are good too. That gentleman there. But okay. in the proposal, you might have to give some visibility and transparency not only to the end goal, but also to the way your strategy is for the transformation. So how do you foresee what yeah. your strategy might be for the transformation? Okay, so to repeat for the, um, uh, for the film, the, um, the question was, how do you, so you're doing a proposal or you're, you're at the beginning of a, of a project or beginning of a, of a team. Um, how, do you, how do you guess? How do you, how do you know what to do? So you've got to ask. You've know, you got to ask what the situation is. And this is a bit of an experience thing, but it's also, um, you know, if you, you can, you know, worst case, you can look it up, I guess. But you've got to understand what the, what the problem that they face. So, you know, you've got to understand this is a globally distributed team, it's regulatory, they're taking on this sort of a, a problem. And you, you do an initial tailoring, you make an initial guess of this is the approach we think is going to work. But I would assume that we will learn and we will improve as we go and that the process has got to change. So um, the process is not carved in stone, right? So part of what we pitch is that we're taking, you know, we're going to start off with the best guess we can, knowing the situation as, as it stands today. We also know the situation will change. The requirements will change. The technology will change. The people involved will change. The priorities will change. We will learn as we go and so on. So there's all these changes. So it's a complex adaptive system. So we assume the process is going to change as well. The approach will change. Um, and then and that's what we, what we pitch. So then we're not, because we want to do the best we can in the situation that we face um, and always try to get better. So that's, um, that's what, how, we, how we sell it, how we pitch it. So. Some people like that, some people don't. 
It is what it is. Um, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, another question. Um, that gentleman there. Actually, just wait for the mic because, you know. Hello. Hi. So my, uh, my question is here, like, uh, like when we expand our team from one sprint to different, different stream, so how this wow factor can be achieved if uh, we are on a one particular sprint, the pressure is there. We are expanding the source to handle the pressure. At the same time, how this wow factor can be achieved inside a sprint or also in a particular, on an all project basis? Okay, so, um, say that again. Um, make it concise. <laughs> yeah. So Sorry. basically how this wow factor can be achieved if we are, uh, have a more pressure on the team yeah. to achieve delivers, then this wow factor, how we can deliver? Any yeah. So how did, yeah, so if I understand your question, so there's pressure on the team to deliver whatever it is that they're delivering. So how can they take time to improve their process? Yeah. Um, I would turn that around. How can we not aff afford to not improve our process? Um, we want to get better. So it's, yeah, it's a little bit of investment to, certainly a little bit of investment to do a retro or to do some sort of learning and to say, hey, we've got this problem. Let's run this experiment to see, you know, w we think this other way of working will help, um, it will help make us better. So there's certainly an investment there of, you know, several days or several weeks, you know, whatever fair amount of time it takes. Um, but at the end of that, we'll know either it, I hope it worked, and if it did, then we've improved. So we, we've gotten faster, we've gotten more effective, we've gotten better. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a maturity thing um, in some ways, but you've got you've to go at risk. You've got you go, to go and trust that this is good. And, and what happens, once you've had several successes like that, um, then it isn't, it isn't really an issue. It's that first few times that you do it that sort of freaks everybody out. Got, oh, you know, we've got to make our schedule uh, you know, meet the budget. And it's, well, yes, but if we continue to work in this slow manner, um, it's going to be a lot harder than if we choose to try to speed up or you know, choose to try to get better. So, yeah, it's a bit of an investment. Yeah, um, thank you. Thanks. That gentleman over there. Hi. Uh, you talked about the improvement that uh, Scrum and Safe brings in 7% and 5%. How, how does that help? Uh, is there a comparative study where in the same organization, a part used uh, DAD and the other one used SAFE. How did it go? Is there anything like that? Other yeah, so uh, I'm going to back about 50 slides. Um, yeah, so the idea is that we, what we're, what we're, there's no magic here, right? So there's, we choose to observe what's worked. So we've seen in all these organizations doing DevOps, what actually worked and what actually helped them get better was this continuous improvement over time. All the case studies are the same. And I, I would invite you to read them. Um, they're all the same. It's all, the message is always, you know, continuous improvement. We've been doing this for years. We're, this is why we're doing all these awesome things now. And, and then, so let's get on that path. So the, and so the challenge with the, these prescriptive frameworks, these prescriptive methods, they're great stuff, but you hit their limits, right? So once you've, you know, once you've exhausted the 18 pages of Scrum, um, it, 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 it got you the improvement it's going to get you, but now you've got to look at something else. So, and same with safe, same with less. They're all great for, at what they do, but once you hit the limit of that, then how do you get beyond the limit, right? And, and then, and, and, and their advice is always the same. It's always, well, fit, you're smart, you can figure it out. And yes, you are smart, and yes, you can figure it out, but when you do it on your own, you end up on this sort of a curve. And, and the, most of the DevOps case studies are like, are on that sort of a curve. Still good, you're still improving, that's awesome, but we can do, we can do it faster by having the humility to understand that other people have solved these problems before us. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to figure these things out. There, this is why we have you know, conferences like this, to share all, the, share all this knowledge, share all these great ideas. So all we're doing in DA is sharing those ideas. And we're saying, hey, you know what? Um, you know, instead of the you know, 12 or 15 practices of Scrum, here's the 500 practices of DA, you choose the ones that make sense for you. So let's get on, you know, at least get on this path, um, you know, break out a method prison that way. Um, but we would suggest, you know what, um, it's worth, worth your while to, you know, pick up, a, pick up a book and maybe, you know, see that, see that you've got some options and hopefully get on this path. Um, because, the, you know, like I said, the challenge is this first step. Unless you're a process expert, you're just guessing and you might, 
you might, you know, you know, it may be if you're out there, you know, Googling things, maybe you'll find it, but you might not even have the language to go search. Uh, I, I see this all the time. And they, you know, they, you know, once, because once you're in method jail, you've got the terminology of that method and of that framework. Well, what about all the knowledge that's outside of that framework? If you only use Scrum terminology, you'll only find Scrum information, which is fine, but you know, we could have the humility to understand, you know what, there's other, other sources of information that might have solved some very common problems. Like a common, uh, last night some of the, uh, you know, we had a speaker party, some of the speakers were, we were discussing uh, architecture and agile and why, why people are still struggling with a basic concept that got solved 20 years ago now. Um, and yet we're still struggling with it because often they don't even, people don't even know to go search or if they do, they might not even have the terminology anymore to search for the wealth of information out there about lean and agile techniques for architecture. Um, so anyway, so it's uh, you know, worth looking at, I think. Um, do we have time for any more questions? Maybe one more. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Hopefully this was of, uh, of value to you. Thank you.